I just talked to uh, Matt Hill and Mark Hildreth too, so I'm kind of. Oh wow! Yeah, both great guys. <laughs> both great guys. I'm trying to go down the line of more. Uh, like I've I've done a lot of inter- interviews with like LA voice actors too, but I'm trying right. to focus on more Canadian people also. Well, you know, we definitely have to be true to uh, you know the local talent that we have here in Canada. Whether we're talking about Vancouver specifically or Toronto specifically, it really just goes to show that there's a lot of really amazing talent here. And anybody who has uh, you know anything to say about it, well, they can just come check us out. <laughs> right. So I wanted to go start from the beginning. Um, sure. What led up to you being in the Lord Fauntleroy? Uh, oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> you, you looked that up. Okay, cool. Okay, so you've you've done a little research. That's fun. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so fun little story. Um, I am a uh, a child of a naval officer. So my oh. dad was was in the uh, armed forces. Uh, obviously, the Canadian uh, armed forces, uh, and he had a great opportunity to go to England on a posting. We've been posted all over Canada. I can't tell you how many times I, I moved as a kid. I I lost track. <laughs> I lost count. And uh, ultimately, it was just about, um, you know, going with the flow. When you're, when you're a Navy brat or an Army brat or an Air Force brat, you just pick up and you just go all over the world. So we moved to England. And I found myself going to the American School in London in St. John's Wood, which was kind of a, you know, a, it was a different kind of area for me. I had never, uh, you know, been to England, although my mother uh, is English and hails from Britain. Uh, so I have roots there, but I had never been. So here I am. I'm like 11 you know, going to this performing arts school. And um, it was all sort of, you know, uh, it was all new. And of course, you know, I didn't really know anybody and I didn't really have a lot of uh, friends at the time. So I just sort of took whatever little opportunities I could to at least have fun. And I had always been in performing arts as a kid. I grew up in uh, Victoria over on Vancouver Island and there was this program for academic and creative enrichment. So, um, you know, I was in that whole program. And uh, yeah, when I was in you know, England living there, there was an opportunity to audition for this project, Little Lord Fauntleroy, because Michael Benz, who was the star of the show, um, he went to my school. So they thought, why not do some casting at the school? Because there's got to be other kids Michael's age. And, you know, we're trying to cast various roles. And I ended up winning the role of Stanley Logan, the streetwise bully. And um, yeah, it was cool. I got to do my first stunt. I went over like a vegetable fruit cart. That was actually me. And I got a big scratch on my face. And it was like, oh, they look, you know, you look, you look really cool with that. So yeah, that was kind of a fun job. I got paid like 200 pounds, which, um, which I thought was a lot of money. Uh, at the time, it was sort of like, oh, I get loads of money, mum. I'm doing this great film. It would be fun. I got to ride out to set on a train. And yeah, it was just a great time. And um, yeah, that was my first experience. But yeah, it, <laughs> I've seen it on Netflix, like oh, here yeah. and there. I'm like, wow, man, like it's still out there. So BBC, where's my money, right? <laughs> so after that, and because I had noticed that according to the timeline that your next on camera thing wasn't until 2001. So that you get into dubbing anime, like right after that, after you moved back to Canada. Well, dubbing and, and um, voiceover in general has really been mainly since uh, the two thousands for me. Um, okay. There are some, um, there, there are some, uh, there are definitely some, some credits listed before 2000, but it really all took off for me. Uh, as a full-time thing living in Vancouver when I when I moved here in um, it was September I believe of, of 2000 so I had just had my birthday and I was 19 turning 20 and I was just uh, about to you know uh, start my career in in Vancouver so yeah um, I quickly got into voiceover because I've always done voices um, when I was a little kid and of course my grandfather's from Britain I was always really sort of like um, fascinated by the way he talked and I knew it was different. I knew it wasn't exactly what you hear every day. Right. Um, you know, cause growing up as a kid in Canada, you hear people who largely sound like you. It's, 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 it's Canadian. We're all just sort of, you know, North American English, but um, yeah, to hear him talk like that, I knew, I knew that was different. So I started to emulate the way he spoke. And I remember one night sort of, uh, you know, calling my sisters in for dinner. I was like, girls, time for supper. And they, and they made a lot of fun of me. <laughs> but yeah. it was, you know, whatever. It was the start of voice acting for me anyway, just doing accents and fun character stuff. And, you know, being a goof off was always kind of uh, a great way to, you know, be in the 
energy of storytelling, you know, and of course, because I was also a musical theater kid, um, there was a lot of storytelling and singing and dancing and, you know, things going on. So yeah, I, uh, I, I've definitely had a good run since it, uh, since it started. Mm -hmm. And do you remember what your first, um, role like in, in an anime series was? Um, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly what year it was i'm not i'm not great with dates but i i think it was there was there was a warrior character who didn't speak a lot there was a lot of battle um you know uh reactions a lot of fighting and uh if i get this wrong i'm sorry i know someone out there is gonna <laughs> correct me and I'm, I'm okay with being wrong i'm sorry it's been a long time i think the character's name was mukala yeah and um, it was it was just sort of like like the way it was broken down to me was that it was just this proud, strong warrior, and there was lots of fighting. So I really got a lot of <laughs> workout on my vocal cords with that one. But yeah, from there on in, I was I was really um, just sort of like everybody else, trying to get the jobs that I could get. And I I'm very much in debt to all the wonderful producers, the studios here in Vancouver, uh, in particularly Ocean. I, I will mention them because they've been just tremendous to me. So wonderful people. Big love to Ocean Studios. <laughs> and you had some, uh, after that, I mean, you had some lead roles in anime, like you were in Boys Over Flowers. Yeah, Boys Over Flowers was one of the first ones. Yeah, that was kind of my introduction to anime teenage drama. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Infinite Revious. Yes, yes. In, in Infinite Revise was really fun. Um, it was <laughs> when they when they sort of pitched that show to me very quickly when I was auditioning. Uh, they basically said it's like Lord of the Flies, but in space. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, that's that sounds like a good idea. And I mean, I, I approach every audition largely the same way, which is what have they chosen as writers and content creators to show me as an artist, right? Where are the opportunities? I, I follow along with, you know, the stage direction because they usually send you scripted pages. As an actor, you kind of get a character breakdown. Maybe there's a, a picture of the character, but there really is a lot of detail to be farmed out of the uh, stage direction, like what we're seeing and what we're hearing, the action and activity. Um, and this is, you know, largely for scripted stuff. There's always going to be a, the difference between prelay and dubbing because right. dubbing you're you're using time code and a lot of the work has already been done to identify certain specific sounds like a gasp reacts well that's time coded if it's specific then if it's in a certain place they've done a lot of work like i said double thumbs up to those people for doing all the uh, translations on scripts and things to bring you know foreign uh you know art and stories to our you know north american market they're you know wonderful they do a great job but in prelay when you're creating something from nothing it's a brand new performance right. that's where you really go is to the stage direction to find those opportunities to voice thoughts and things and events or reactions so yeah it really is um you know it, it really is a process but um mm -hmm. yeah little by little that's that's how we try and grow our business as as artists is to just get as familiar as possible with the industry what's happening what's the expectation with the quality of work and yeah we just we just keep going from there so yeah it really is a great uh it it's a great job i am <laughs> i'm not even gonna try and fib <laughs> i guess based uh in terms of anime your first like really big role would have been on gundam seed Yes, Gundam C was a huge uh, shift for me because um, that character, um, uh, I'm assuming we're talking about Isaac Jewell. Yeah. Um, it was a great combination of that intense rage mixed with giant fighting robots <laughs> because he had, he had a pretty intense backstory and he was himself a very intense character. So there was a lot of that, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of vocal demand, I will say that. But um, yeah, it, it's always nice to, you know, get get on a show that's got some meat and bones. You know, it's not just, oh, I'm, and don't get me wrong, I'm always grateful as a performer when they say, oh, we have a role, it's an incidental, it might not be as large as a principal role, but, you know, for me, it's just, it's it's just been my experience. I can only ever speak from my experience. I'm I'm not setting any industry standards anywhere, but it's always just been about getting on the radar of a content creator or a producer or a studio let them see you let them know you let them hear your range i mean uh, i'm a, i'm a producer myself i've created lots of demos for you know voiceover hopefuls i've 
written scripts. I've coached people for, I mean, I, I think I'm nearing 10,000 hours, you know, so it's mm. sort of a, a different process for me as someone who's looking for something in a line. I'm sort of like always trying to reverse engineer that process as a performer mm. because it's about how much scope you can bring to what you're doing. And like I said, farming details out of the script is where you get all those vocal opportunities. So, yeah, I mean, you go from one show to the next and you try and feed off of uh, what you learned. And I learned a lot from Gundam. So, yeah, I'm always sort of looking for Gundam toys and being like, oh, that one's pretty cool. It's kind of small, though. Okay, maybe maybe go get another, maybe go get another one that's a little bigger. <laughs> and even further with, um, with anime, like, with even more emotional roles with uh i'm sure that was better with death note and black yeah lagoon. <laughs> death note and black lagoon are sort of in a camp all their own when you think about the kind of storytelling that we see coming together for a much more adult market when yeah. we talk about the age range or the demographic or the target audience those are all just you know ways of saying what's appropriate for whom according to what the story covers and when you take Death Note, like that's <laughs> that's that's a very special kind of circle. Um, fun fact for anyone who's interested: in the opening of I I believe it was episode one, there's that sort of beautiful field of death, and there's all these demons, and there's this sort of strange, sort of throaty, you know, murmuring. I got to do the throaty murmur. It was just like, oh. like, like, like the first cue of, of uh, episode one. Um, yeah, I think anyway, it was, uh, yeah, kind of fun. But um, totally different material, totally different storytelling, totally different style. And the, like the subject matter, definitely the gore and the violence and like that sort of, like there are, there are some moments that are pretty vile. So mm -hmm. yeah. Again, like I said, you sort of build and you grow from every show that you do and you just take away a little bit more every time. Okay, did I learn something from that session that would make my future sessions earlier? Like a big tip, <laughs> if you can ask them to save the screaming for the end of the session, maybe ask for that. That will help right. voices go far. I mean, you know, there's so much that we can do to take care of our instrument, but there's also a lot we can do to run a smart session. And this is, again, for anybody who's even recording at home, run a smart session. If you've got lots of big and lots of screams and you know all that kind of stuff, I'd say save that for the end because we know that working from home is kind of a new thing now. Disney has said it, Netflix have, have said it. Oh, you think you've seen animation? You haven't seen nothing yet. It's now, especially during COVID times, the smartest and safest way to work is recording and working remotely and having people use the network and bringing everything together in a connectivity that's bankable. You can use that to your advantage because the recording artist doesn't need to necessarily be anywhere near the engineer or the producers. They can all be on Zoom. We can audition that way. We can work that way. And we can really build a good network of trust, albeit the technology, we're, we're trusting that to function as well. But there's a lot that we can gain from really tapping into performance and then wearing a few other hats with all these other, you know, technological aspects as well. But like I said, save the yelling for the end. We're just going to cut it, snip it and move it into place. Right. It's all puzzle pieces. We know how that puzzle works. Just, you know, don't touch the sides. It's like operation. You gotta, you gotta just, just hit it just right. And those, the, the two dubs of those two shows specifically are amazing. Yeah. Like, I think Black everybody... Lagoon was the first time I got to swear in a show. I was like, you oh. want me to say what? You want me to curse? I'm yeah. like, I don't know if I can do that. I, I, I voice kids shows sometimes. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, but we did. And yeah, I mean, Black Lagoon was also, again, very much geared towards that mature audience, I'll say. Right. And I didn't even realize until going back and looking at it, because I saw it a long time ago, but when you were in um, Sword of the Stranger, like I didn't, I didn't know that you were the lead guy in that. <laughs> yeah, that was a great, um, that was a great experience. It was fun to record that with um, uh, a young local actor, uh, Aiden Drummond, and he uh, did some tremendous work. We, we, we had some, you know, remote sessions where I could hear his work and I played off of that. And uh 
Yeah, it was just such a great story. And it's also nice, I mean, keeping in mind that there's no such thing as a bad voice, just a voice that hasn't been bought yet, right? Mm -hmm. It was nice to do a character that was close to my own voice, you know? Because sometimes things get kind of cartoony and you could be in a very silly place <laughs> or a very animated, you know, kind of fun place. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to be able to do these, you know, these these epic tales sometimes also so yeah it was fun to voice no name and i really loved there was this beautiful moment spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen it yet um although you can watch it anywhere i'm sure <laughs> there's lots of places pop a link in the bottom there's gonna be <laughs> a link somewhere to watch it um in those final moments you know riding off into the sunset on horseback again spoiler alert i said it i said it twice that sort of you know gentle trickling of blood in the sand and the water i was like mm -hmm. He still might not make it. I was <laughs> sort of right. left on this like wonderful, beautiful, poetic, uh, you know, cliffhanger. So yeah, that was kind of fun. I had a great time with that one. What was your reaction to? Uh, yeah, because the character that you played on Inuyasha was for a little while. It was like for. Yeah, it was. It was just nice even to step into that universe, you know, because it has such a massive falling, uh, following. I should say, pardon me, and. Um, you know, that following, that community sort of, they have an expectation, you know, and when we enter the casting process, so many times as actors, we kind of take for granted that there's, yes, there is an original performance. We are, again, we are dubbing an original story from its source country in whatever language that it comes from, be it French or Spanish or German or, you know, uh, you know, Chinese or, you know, Japanese. There's, there's so many wonderful stories being told in so many wonderful ways you just take for granted that yes someone has done it already i'm trying to pay homage to that i'm trying to respect and observe that and in a lot of ways the clients actually want you to kind of embody some of the energies so that the character still has that same flow and can follow that same arc um you know, from start to finish, because it's not just the arc of the scene or the arc of the first act or the arc of the second act working up to the third, to the, you know, like, it's not just break it down. Like it, you have to paint with, you know, all the different um, colors of each character. So yeah, you, you look at, um, <laughs> you look at a character on, on Inuyasha and it immediately raises the bar. Um, but yeah, that was really fun. That was, that was, uh, it was, it was also a, the, the first time I, I kind of encountered a very, you know, like, like a soft and gentle character that had all this mysticism and all this power and all this complexity as well. But I mean, you know, it was also fun to have a cool name like Byakuya of the Dreams. <laughs> right. I was like, cool. It's, it's not like Smith or Jones. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. this, other, this other thing entirely. And shortly after that, one of your... Uh, more recent anime roles uh, on Gintama. Yeah, Gintama really, really blew, uh, really blew my socks off. That was, <laughs> that was that was really fun. Yeah, specifically, I like that. Um, and I mean, whether people are aware of this or not, I I'm going to drop his name because he's just so wonderful and lovely. And I actually talked to him today. Um, yeah, Michael Dangerfield, who yeah. I played opposite, such a wonderful, kind, giving actor person i just yeah i i really treasure him he's great but to hear his lines <laughs> and then get to play off of that when you know that and if you haven't seen gintawa again spoiler alert <laughs> there's some interesting stuff <laughs> there is there's some stuff that you know will will make you think absolutely so yeah it was really uh it was really a, a great, a great piece of fun. Again, stepping into a more, you know, um, adult-centric, you know, anime. And before I go on to other stuff uh, with anime, who do you think that you're most attached to as a character that you've played? Well, I mean, speaking strictly to anime, yeah, I've really developed, you know, a fondness for so many characters because of, you know. Uh, they're all so different. I mean, mm -hmm. I can think about, you know, Boys Over Flowers. I can think about Trouble Chocolate. I can think about my work on, you know, uh, Death Note. You know, we mentioned that and, you know, Black Lagoon and, you know, all these characters. I mean, Death Note has a special place in my heart because I, I got to do the voiceover and then the English dub of the film. Oh, and, yeah. you know, and, and of course, you know, 
Ray Pember had, you know, a particular significance for some people. So that was, you know, kind of nice. But, you know, having having just mentioned it, I actually really have an affinity for No Name. Yeah. Um, I just, I really, I really liked the makeup of his character and the story, his backstory in particular. It was just so heartbreaking. But again, you know, it, it is always, I think, our attempts as people wherever we are from around the world whatever lore or folklore or stories that are you know our um origins give us i mean it's it's always nice to see that there's still a moral tale being told like this is the consequence for bad actions this is the consequence for you know he obviously felt a lot of cowardice for having listened to his you know former master and taken the life of that child again sorry spoilers like watch it and just say you know so i mean he had a lot of complexity and i think that's what most actors look for and i mean this is this is a note for anyone making content give a compelling character mm -hmm. to an actor who can feel their way through it who can take direction of course and give life to something but there's a certain three-dimensionality that we seek when we're listening to things and i mean i listen to, with my eyes closed a lot because i'm trying to see do i get the visual do i hear what's happening or am i lost somewhere you know and that's really a, a good full body yes for me like yes i hear it i, I can see it with my eyes closed that's how you know it's going to be real and anybody writing for animation or creating their own project for fan fiction or their channels all the social media out there make compelling work and you will find the right performer. But don't rule yourself out as well. You are also a voice. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that because shout out to your art. <laughs> just, so you know, just go with it. <laughs> so going, going back to on camera stuff, um, how, would, how would you end up getting the role, uh, role in uh, Walking Tall? Walking Tall was actually, it's, it's funny you should ask about that. It, it's one of my, it's one of my more, um, you know, kind of vivid memories in the audition room. And it happens a lot. Uh, well, I, again, I can only speak for myself, you know, uh, it, it happens a lot to me where I go into the room, there's a brief introduction, maybe a questions asked, you know, you know, once upon a time, people used to shake hands, you know, when meeting. Um, <laughs> and really, it, it just sort of, it kind of comes over you for a moment like a wash and you're just in it. I remember that audition in particular because I actually wasn't auditioning for the role that I ended up being cast for. Oh. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful that they saw something else in me and I, I was able to play um, one of Hamilton's goons. That was, that was kind of fun. But I remember that audition in particular because I was reading for, it was, I, I think it was just like a low level enforcer, a drug dealer or, or someone in, in, in that moment. But I remember um, the director, you know, he just said, wow, man, you got those eyes. And I was like, okay, is that good? Because <laughs> like, I was reading my lines and it was just sort of, I have, this, I have this sort of very, you know, like articulated eyebrow that can just sort of disappear. But yeah. I mean, it was, it was sort of this heavy moment and he was just sort of, you know, heavy and tough guys, right? It's, it's that sort of energy. I mean, you know, but he was like, man, those eyes. I was like, I hope you like it. But I ended up booking a, a much, a, a much uh, larger role. And I ended up, you know, being on set for quite a lot of days. And mm -hmm. of course, working with, you know, The Rock um, is uh, amazing. Dwayne is such a, a, a down to earth, connected human. He was nothing but nice to me and to everyone he met. He was always smiling and waving and introducing himself and making sure everybody had what they needed. Big smile on his face, just, you know, walking around with his big bag, you know, getting out of his truck, just super happy to be there. And he just, he took a lot of time to connect with people. And um, uh, literally, <laughs> funny story, he actually connected with me in that casino scene. There's that wonderful moment. I've got the shotgun and I'm sort of looking for him and over the bar. And um, it was a fabulous little cameo. Uh, April Tellick was sort of, you know, huddling from the danger on the floor. And um, I, uh, I sort of came back and he hits the shotgun and hits me in the face and we worked out this big stunt and I did all my own fighting. It was a lot of action actor stuff. And in the scene, in the moment, and Dwayne's wonderful at fighting. Like we fought a couple times in the, in the right. movie for anyone who's seen it, you know, but he's 
really, really good. I want to say that first. He is really, really good. Shout out to Dwayne. We love you, Rock. But he flipped the prop. And this was a four by four made to look like balsam wood, like a big piece of wood, because that's like the character piece. He carries the massive stick, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> um, one end is very soft. One end is a little harder for holding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he does this flip and catches the other end and that huge haymaker just comes across my face and connects with my very crow magnet brow and I go down mm. like I'm supposed to. I mean, that was the, the deal in the shot. You get hit, you go down. But I went down <laughs> and he, without knowing, because you, you don't know, right? You're supposed to, there's that, you know, uh, there's that window. It's a very narrow window between connecting and not. But again, I love you, Rock. Love you, Dwayne. Um, <laughs> one of the other stunt guys, you know, um, picked me up. He's like, man, are you okay? Are you okay? You're fine. I'm like, mm -hmm. just leaning a little. He's like, yep, stand up, stand up. Hey, we're good. We're good. Yeah, look, we're gonna get some water. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, I, I, I hope I'm okay. <laughs> How was the shot? He's like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it for right now. <laughs> but I mean, it was one of those, um, you know, uh, moments where you kind of think, oh man, I, I, I hope they got that because I don't want to do it again. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then of course, you know, Kevin Bray, the director called me over to, you know, the monitors and he was like, hey, hey, can we, can, can, yeah, no, can we get Rock over here? And he's like, Michael, come here. Michael, come here. He's just like, Dwayne, come here. And we kind of, both of us come in around the camera and he's looking at the thing and he looks at Dwayne and just totally flat. He goes, Rock, you hit my man just now. <laughs> it was like, oh, now I'm really embarrassed. Oh, I shouldn't be here. Oh, now he's looking at me. He's going to feel bad. And he's like, no way, did I? And he goes, yeah, you flipped the thing. Play it back. Play it back. He's playing the video back. And he's like, you flipped the thing and you hit my man. And he's like, Michael, I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's okay. It's fine. It's all good. I have a I have a big shield and I'm, I made a joke about my eyebrows and uh, yeah, no, we, we had a good chat a little while later after that, we're talking about tattoos and mana and everything. And he was like, yo, that gave me goosebumps, man. Like talking about, um, you know, just some work that I have on me, but man, he's a great guy. And that is, still to this day is one of those really cool movies that I look back on as being, um, you know, just grateful to be a part of. I mean, you know, Kevin Durant was also really, you know, uh, you know, tremendous energy on that film. And he's someone who I, you know, have connected with in the years since. He's just a great guy and he's really blown up too. He's all over. So yeah, just a lot of good memories. That's cool. Yeah. The, and the same year uh, you were part of a ser uh, TV series that I thought was really underrated, the horror series, The Kingdom Hospital. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I um, I like like everybody going on to a film project or a TV project. You sort of, you know, I, I think you you graciously accept this role, however small or impactful. But it really is just to tell the story. And I mean, some stories don't end up being as popular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of you know reasons or theories or thoughts as to why that happens and they you know they, they they focus on the writing or the acting or the directing or the story itself or the tone and there, there's so many departments there there, there really is like <laughs> there's no one that i i think i mean because i i like to see the best in people but there's no one at fault for telling a story mm -hmm. it just depends on the lens that you have when you're listening to it um and yeah, I had, a, I had a great time on that show. And uh, there was a lot of fun moments too, for sure. Sort of <laughs> remembering reading a book and crying. <laughs> it's like, yep, this is my job. I'm supposed to sit here and read a book and have a little cry. <laughs> Just have a little cry. Did you get to interact much with Andrew McCarthy? Like meet him or anything? You know what? There, there, there was, you know, a, a sort of wonderful flash meeting, and you know, at at the time, because obviously this is this is years ago. Um, you know, there was multiple things stacked in multiple rooms, and it was all very close quarters. So they'd be doing like a table read over there, and you know, we're doing a, an effects <laughs> test over there. So when you're in a studio setup and there's multiple things going on, you know, it's it's kind of craziness. But I mean, if you 
if you have a moment and you get to shake someone's hand and say hi, and then there's sort of a ship's passing in the night kind of feel, yeah, that happens a lot too. But uh, yeah, it, it's always fun to share the screen uh, on a horror movie because, right. uh, or, or, or TV show as, you know, the case would have it. But um, man, <laughs> it, can get, it can get hairy. It can get intense when you're covered in blood and it's take 19 and you're outside and it's freezing cold. You're like, what was the line again? I can't feel my hands. <laughs> like, this is incredible. Are we still rolling? Oh God. Okay, great. You know, like you just, you just go with it. But I mean, I've had my head blown up. I've died over, I think I've died over. And I mean, anyone who wants to forensically look this up, I challenge you, you can, you can at me and reach out. I think I've died somewhere like 50 to 55 times on, on camera, on screen. So yeah, wow. I've died. I, I've died many ways. Um, <laughs> many many times <laughs> yeah i don't know a lot of people that have a piece of their face in a jar like it's just like it's just oh yeah no just decoration part of my face funny story um yeah that was from horns i got to my head oh yeah up. yeah i was i mean i was going to order but of course i was going to ask you about your experience working on that movie too yeah, Horns, um, well, now that we're already talking about it, Horns was really fun. Uh, of course, Daniel Radcliffe is a tremendous actor and right. just such a wonderful person. Um, very warm on set, very welcoming, very, you know, humble and professional. And yeah, Dan and I had a, had a great time. He was He was wonderful to be around. And he, of course, was taking on such a huge um, weight with that role. And, um, right. you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of work, but we all just sort of, you know, focused on what we were doing, obviously, you know, playing Eric as, his, you know, his, his, his childhood friend grown up. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was really, it was really fun to just rely on the fact that there was a lot of that friendship energy and it was like lifelong friendship. Like, yo, someone grows up in your town, and you were kids together and now one of them is kind of on the fringes of law abiding and the other one is in law enforcement like there's a lot of tension but of course you know you wrap that in the whole story of the murder and the story of his you know being you know held to blame and held to account for that and i yeah. mean again you know it's complicated but i really enjoyed being able to bring eric's truth to the table because you know your your work is your bond to the character and even if you don't necessarily have certain things in common you know i mean you know it's it's worth mentioning at this point this was the first kissing scene i had performed with the fellow actor mm -hmm. and it was really just about making the decision that you know, with the lore and the story being what it is, the compulsion that the horns offer, people, you know, just immediately snap into their true selves and say whatever's on their mind. And they blurt out, you know, lots of things. And they do lots of things for anyone who's seen the movie. You know what I'm talking about. But I really enjoyed the fact that Eric's truth was his, his love for someone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, I just, yeah. I just took the energy uh, again that, you know, was brought to that set, you know, largely by Dan. Dan always elevates the set, elevates the work. And you just, you just do what you do, mm -hmm. you know, and two men who love each other, who kiss, that's part of a story. Right. And story ends so tragically getting his head blown off, but then they give you a piece of the head to keep and it all feels better. <laughs> <laughs> I guess going off of that too, I can just ask uh, with you, what's the most um, difficult uh, job you've had with an uh, on-camera role and portraying something that was so unlike yourself? Wow. Um, I mean, a a as you can imagine from my appearance and from the body of work that I've, I've accumulated, I've played a lot of bad guys. Right. A lot of guys who look bad. And then there's been guys that looked good, but were bad. And there's been <laughs> variations of bad and evil and dark and all these other words, of course, they're just labels, but you can get pigeonholed as an actor. So when the opportunity comes up to play against your type and to play away from, you know, that which you are, you really, I, I think you, you should always take that opportunity 
and um, I'm I'm specifically gonna reference War for the Planet of the Apes okay. because there's no bigger transformation than you know changing species like right. literally becoming an animal and i mean obviously through the magic of motion capture and working with andy circus um you know has has really shown me that that kind of work um is possible and i mean a big shout out to terry notary i love you terry um terry did all of the movement work, the body work, coaching, the ape work, the movement classes. I mean, he busted our rumps <laughs> for sure. It was definitely the hardest physical preparation I've ever done for a film. There was several hours of horse riding in the morning. And then we went to the studio. We did several hours of quadrupedal work, you know, on our stilts sort of running around the parking lot and scaring people in their cars and sort of <laughs> aping around, making a general sort of apish kind of like ruckus, which is really fun. But yeah, Terry Notary and his direction and his coaching really brought such an amazing level of work to everyone on set. I mean, myself, uh, I'll name some locals, Alex Ponovic and, you know, um, Ty Olson. There was so many wonderful things, you know, that I, I got to see, you know, Alessandro Giuliani do, you know, in his role as Spear. And there's just so many, so many hours that went into that, Um you know, I'm, I'm blanking on some names, forgive me. But uh, yeah, no, it really, it really did bring so many people together. And um, yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely the hardest job I've ever had because motion capture, it's not just voice work. It's the body work. It's the facial capture. There's a camera like right here. Right. And it just sort of stays geocentrically attached to your face, no matter what you do. Uh, if that's a word, maybe I didn't use that word right. Anyway, I don't know. Long and the short of it. It was a tremendous experience. Working with Andy Circus was a, a life-changing, life-changing thing for me. Big love to you, Andy. I love you. Um, yeah, you've uh, been a huge, ex you know, huge inspiration. So yeah, shout out to you. Love, Andy. Um, <laughs> it really is, um, you know, again, so many departments. Matt Reeves uh, was our, you know, wonderful director, our captain. You know, um, he made that film such a joy to work on. And I got to see so many wonderful artists do their work. Like they tell you that it's like, oh, this is only layer six. I'm like, how many layers are there in the animation reference? They're like 6,000. And I'm like, wow. but it's breathtaking already. I just, <laughs> can I have it? <laughs> just like, give it to me. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you think about gray renders without the fur, without the animation, like I can watch that movie and I still don't, like, my mind is still tricked by my eye. Like, those are real apes. And I'm like, you know, that's not really you. It is. <laughs> it is. But you're wearing a, a suit, you know? So, yeah, Luca was a tremendous experience uh, for me. And, um, yeah, man, I'm always, uh, I'm always thinking about how much fun it was to chase cars <laughs> <laughs> on, on uh, stilts. That was great. And with the amount of darker roles you've had in projects, um, mm -hmm. is there anything that you think, or has there been has there been anything that you uh, said that you wouldn't do? Well, in terms of like content, yeah, I definitely, I definitely have a very personal feeling towards how my work has influenced the narrative mm. in culture because I have done some things on camera, which are crimes in the real world. Right. Yeah. And that being said, there's, there's a certain amount of weight that comes with that mm -hmm. because you meet an actor and then moments later you're fighting. It's weird. <laughs> You know, you meet an actress, you know, or potentially, you know, like a young actor. And the next minute, you're shouting obscenities at them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like playing the bad guy. Playing the bad guy has, has taught me a lot about being a good guy. Mm -hmm. About living the life of a good person. Trying mm -hmm. to find whatever it is that this whole thing is, right? It's just... 
discovering the way by feeling the feelings that come along with doing these things like like hey want to do some crimes like i've been there i've done some crimes on camera for money in a weird fictional context like <laughs> some of the stuff i've done it, it does it does leave you with a particular feeling and for me that's always been what has my artistic contribution always been by doing all these dark and heavy roles and mm -hmm committing crimes basically on camera <laughs> under totally safe circumstances no one was injured ever except for me a bunch of times but that's okay one guy i broke my phone threw me into a car but that happened <laughs> whatever you know it's like how did i impact my community how did i impact the viewership how was i you know how was i employed in in that way as a storyteller and you think about all the dark stuff and you kind of go should I maybe have refused based on the content? Because I don't agree with that. And then I decided, you know what? It's a lot like saying we don't want to tell bad stories because bad people don't exist. Mm -hmm. We know that that's not true. Sadly, I wish it wasn't the case. I, I wish that bad people didn't exist. There are people who do evil. They commit crimes and there's punishment for that. There's a societal system of shaming and prison and reform and all these other things. And yeah, people make mistakes and whatever, but I have played those people, done those crimes, <laughs> done all that stuff, been paid for it and then have no consequence. It's like, okay, this, this appears like it could be fun. At the end of the day, you kind of wonder, did I really do a good job by portraying this really bad person? You know, I've had people say things to me on set that would turn your head like, man, you're a, such an a-hole and other expletives and other curse words. <laughs> you know, like I've had people threaten me not to be like, hey man, don't you be mean to our bleep character. And I'm like, okay, I'm just here. <laughs> but it comes with the territory, right? So I think that's why for me, I, I, I now gravitate a lot towards comedy. Um, you know, I have, a, I have some things in development, which I'll, you know, keep to myself for the moment. But um, yeah, I, growing up in, you know, musical theater, I like doing funny. I like comedy. You know, I like lighthearted stuff. But sometimes when they're like, he's terrifying, let's hire him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, just people, people don't often get the chance to um, really get to know an actor unless they you know, have interviews unless they exchange thoughts and, you know, moments with fans and people get a sense of who they really are. And I mean, you know, you might see some stuff on the screen, but that's not me. <laughs> you know, it's just, again, um, it is, it is a skill and sometimes it's hard. I mean, it's hard to be the bad guy, but sometimes, you know, you get to wear like cool prosthetics or, you know, be, a big 54 foot tall giant and work for Steven Spielberg, which was again, I mean, the, uh, the BFG was life changing, but yeah, still another bad guy. The big dumpy baby bad guy. <laughs> but still a bad guy. Nonetheless, man, they ate kids. Come on. <laughs> You're a bad dude, man. You ate children. <laughs> and re related, related to that too. Do you have a particular process in, once you get so into a role like that, how do you get out of that and go back into just being yourself? You know, it, it's kind of funny because I've, I've had variations of this, of this question, you know, asked before over the, over the years. And I always kind of explain it in a very simple way. And now it makes me smile because of COVID. Um, but um, I, I characterize it like a house party. <laughs> and it's like there's this giant palatial mansion this huge building and it's full of all these people all these characters that i portrayed and played whether it's voiceover tv or film and it's like <laughs> it's like you get to open the door and walk in and you just you see everybody mm -hmm. right it's like looking at your paintings for the painter or looking at your drawings for the sketch artist or you know <laughs> sculpture for the sculptor you just look at what you made you look at the art, you can stand back and appreciate it, but it's always kind of funny. Um, so yeah, stepping into, stepping into a character is really like visiting a friend. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to be careful how I say that because some of the characters I portrayed are not good people. I would never be friends with some of the people I have portrayed, which is why there's a basement in that mansion. <laughs> we just we just don't go there 
<laughs> we just leave that locked up and like, ah, da, da, da. you know, all the fun people are on the main floor. So yeah, <laughs> it's called compartmentalizing. <laughs> yeah. And I do want to ask even, um, I do want to ask about uh, your experience, uh, how it was with you on uh, Twilight. Twilight was a lot of fun. Um, I, I had uh, an interesting, it was an interesting kind of, encounter i guess um I, I did a workshop with peter deloise very early on in my career and it was sort of like okay let's begin the day and we will you know look at your headshot and look at your resume and talk about your you know work potential and what's your audition style and basically just break down what you're doing to try and get more work so you know he looked at my headshot he was flipping it back and forth he's like wow you got huge eyebrows <laughs> <laughs> i was like what He's like, ah, that's okay. You seem to be getting work despite them. So, you know, maybe if you know somebody, maybe they can clean that up for you. I don't know. Do you have a girlfriend? Maybe she can help you out. And I was like, okay, now I'm embarrassed because you're saying this in front of all these people. But he actually, in the next few minutes, you know, he actually said something that I'll remember forever. Peter said to me, he goes, do you have your motorcycle license? And I said, no. And he goes, okay, see, that's the opportunity for you to lie. But I'll tell you maybe why you shouldn't, because when it comes to riding horses or motorcycles, it's always best to be safe and say, I'm really interested to get behind that and get some training, but I have only a little experience, you know, with motorcycles or horses, mm -hmm. you know? So he was like, you could have lied. You could lie. People lie. Just say, yep, I do it all the time. And then when you get there, like, yeah, no, call stunts. I'm, I'm busy, <laughs> you know? But I actually, after that, went and got my motorcycle license. And several times over the years, including Twilight, I was able to get on a motorcycle, show the stunt uh, coordinator what I could do as a rider with a license. And, you know, like legally, I'm allowed to operate a motorcycle. And yeah, it's, it's always been great for them to be like, wow, dude, yeah, you can ride. That's, that's awesome. Go to it. So if you, if you see me on a motorcycle, with the exception of very few shots, um, in Twilight, that's that's actually me riding, and uh, it was really fun. With the exception of the end, that huge sort of like skid to a stop, yeah. <laughs> where sort of you know uh, Kristen Stewart is like hanging on for dear life, and she's just you know dismounting the bike. Um, yeah, it uh, it was a cool green screen rail slide arm that did this huge like hydraulic little. <laughs> So that was kind of fun. But yeah, it was really nice um, to be on a film that, again, shoots here locally in, in Vancouver. I'm, uh, you know, I sort of work in the lower mainland. Big shout out to Vancouver. Hashtag, you know, BC film. Um, <laughs> we're always just trying to, you know, provide the best environment possible for everyone that comes here to shoot movies. And when you got a big movie in town like Twilight, well, hey, you got to you got to step up and you got to see what you can do to get on the show. And I'm like, I can ride a motorcycle and harass people. <laughs> I don't mean to harass you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it's actually fun because I, I, that's when I, um, I I briefly met Anna Kendrick. Oh yeah, I love Anna Kendrick. She's so wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> she was great. But I mean, you know, she at, at that point was you know had had yet to really you know um, blow up and make a name for herself. But yeah, just such a wonderful, wonderful person. Very brief sort of hi, how are you in passing. But uh, yeah, but again, that's that's sort of what happens, you know, in in film. You have these brief exchanges with people on their way to go do something else. <laughs> and going on uh, to more recent um, projects and stuff, uh, do you have a story involving being on the Exorcist TV series? Man, the Exorcist was heavy. <laughs> that was a heavy show i mean yeah you talk about and i mean for anybody who hasn't seen the episode i'll sort of you know spin it this way the idea that a small town sheriff's wife would be possessed and spewing black evil everywhere and there's like nothing you can do i mean like those are really high stakes and we get these we, we get a lot of these high stakes shows because they're based on thriller or horror or the paranormal and I mean supernatural is another local show I've had the good fortune to be on you know Stargate another you know sort of supernatural otherworldly show that shot here you know Smallville very much a uh, you know like a DC you know universe you know super powered show but the stakes are really big and when you've got the stakes that are so simple and so real because I don't know what everybody believes. It's totally up to the individual, but there has been a lot of video footage about people 
who appeared to be possessed, just saying, lots of lots of proof, go do some research, check it out. You know, like that was that was kind of like a real deal episode. The stakes were yeah. very real, despite all the paranormal and despite the special effects and, you know, all this stuff. But yeah, working on that show was really fun. And, um, you know, again, you know, I have some experience now after 20 years of working with firearms, you know, it's like always fun when you get to hang out the window at work and blast off the 12 gauge at somebody and racking, you know, like that was always fun. It's always fun to work with things that are outside of your norm. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you know, flying down a dirt road with your head out the window, is not something you do every day. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, good fun, good fun. Great people, exorcists, love all those people. And you probably also have, uh, since you, I was gonna mention it, but uh, with Supernatural too. Yeah, Supernatural has been kind of, you know, I think just a, a staple of Vancouver for so many years. I mean, I'm I'm personally sad to see it go just because I know the family that was built mm-hmm. with that crew, with that cast is, is just, you know, for them, I, I know it's it's a big end to a big chapter, but, you know, stories sometimes end and we get to love them and appreciate them for what they are. And it's hundreds of thousands of, you know, people hours and it, it, so much work went into it but yeah i mean supernatural was very was very good to me they were very kind to me uh my first character became an interesting meme i gather somebody sent me a meme oh. and i was like well i'm a i'm a supernatural meme uh, <laughs> um uh, felicia day did an episode i think it was the girl with the um dungeons and dragons tattoo and oh. um yeah, forgive me if I got that wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, so meeting Felicia Day was lovely. And, you know, uh, because of the scene work, she was the only person that I actually had camera time with mm-hmm. um, because, um, you know, the other part of the phone conversation was uh, in, in, in the van, of course. But uh, yeah, I got to be security guard Bill, who liked working out and staying fit. <laughs> that was kind of fun, you know, but it's a character, right? So you're often just playing like, you know, a stereotypical kind of, I, I don't know, like name an occupation. There's a stereotype of, of uh, you know, that character. But um, yeah, and then coming back uh, to um, portray the Norse gods of chaos was kind of fun. I got to wear like a gold crush velvet suit and play cards and got a neck rub it was yeah it was really fun you know you think about uh how many stories they've thrown into the mix for you know vancouver actors and yeah to get two different roles in two different seasons is um yeah it's kind of it's kind of fun it's a nice um yeah it's uh yeah nice to have that on the old resume and most recently too with uh from just from last year on being on the twilight zone yeah what a show man they built a huge tank it was so incredible to see the work that went into that tank um my my good friend lloyd cunningham a very prominent stuntman uh here in vancouver and now uh around the world he you know works internationally um yeah lloyd is my buddy but he's also doubled me for a bunch of things and he had um he had the fantastic fantastic privilege of dying for me um (laughs) in the water and he put up this really amazing fight and he was knifing the thing and there was blood bubbling and you know it's like oh oh poor lloyd (laughs) you know um he's actually uh working working on a uh working on a show right now out in toronto i'm I'm pretty sure he's um you know double uh doubling for uh uh oh maybe i shouldn't say his name tease okay (laughs) anyway but yeah it was it was a lot of fun on twilight zone and um yeah it's uh it it was definitely fun to again just play dead (laughs) you know because that's that's what i do i die good people i die good (laughs) And this is something I like to always ask um, on camera actors. Uh, has there ever been anything that you had a chance to um, audition for that was really like major and iconic afterward or that you like wish that you got be- to be a part of or anything like that? Oh, wow. Like so many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard to pick one, but there's definitely 
you know, like there's a couple that stand out and because they had significant, you know, other aspects to the story. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I think I was working on Walking Tall. I was at a party and I bumped into Wesley Snipes, oh. who, I then, who, who I then got to tell, oh, dude, it's so great to meet you. It's, it's really funny. I actually just auditioned for this role in Blade. Oh, I hope I get it, man. It, it, it would be great to see you. Nice, nice to meet you. I will, I will let you keep on. Thanks so much. You know, fingers crossed for me. And he was like, yeah, man, that's cool. All right. We'll keep an eye out for you. Take care. All the best. And we just sort of, again, it was one of those two minute conversations. And I was like, I guess this is the time I met Wesley Snipes. But you know, uh, when you only meet someone for two minutes and you have years and years and years of films in your head different characters different things you know it's it's kind of surreal for that one moment just to be like oh wow i guess this is the i was today years old when i bumped into this person at a party or you know i had a job as a reader because often when you're acting you get jobs that are not necessarily acting but you're facilitating another aspect of being in a film production, which is you, you could be a reader, you could be a stand-in. I was, I was a stand-in uh, on, on a show and you know, there was some really high profile people. And it's like, wow, okay, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just standing in for so-and-so and that's, that's my job today. But I actually got to be Al Pacino's reader uh, when he was in Vancouver, again, yay Vancouver. He was here working on um, a film and it had a lot of gambling jargon a lot of gambling words and there was a lot of stats and a lot of long runs of dialogue so through a very basic interview process the list of readers got whittled down and then you know i ended up working with al pacino in wow. his hotel room at a big table going over scripts and then i was on set for al when he needed me and i was in his trailer when he needed me to go over lines and he was making phone calls and then matthew mcconaughey's at the door when he's got couscous salad in his hands and i'm like this this, this is all just happening this is okay this is happening in vancouver you know i'm like i'm in al pacino's trailer and matthew mcconaughey just walked in and he was like, hey, Al, man, I just want to give you some couscous salad. I made it home, man. It's delicious. And he's like, oh, that's great. Uh, uh, hey, uh, uh, Matthew, this is Michael, uh, local guy, actor. Uh, Michael, Matthew. And he's like, hey, man. I was like, hey. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is happening in Vancouver. And I mean, I think that's why I'm so glad after all these years that I've cut my teeth in one place. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've been on a lot of shows, I've done a lot of animation, I've done a lot of voiceover, you know, varying, you know, topics, varying genres, but you, you really cannot be working here. So if you're out there and you're watching this video and you're looking for somewhere to come shoot a TV show or a movie, look no farther than Vancouver. We got you. <laughs> one of the, I guess one of the last two things I can ask you is I, um, well, with you specifically, I'm sure you have uh, a lot of stories, but if there's one specific story that you can pick about, uh, like working with Kirby Moreau and your memory of him and everything. Uh, yeah, that, um, that's been really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, these last, uh, you know, weeks, if not, you know, months have been really, really hard. Um, mm -hmm. Losing my friends so suddenly and yeah. Uh, I think, um, I mean, you, you stand next to someone for for that many years and there's there's just like there's no one thing that you can pick out about them um and i mean it wasn't it, it's not just work i mean we were, were doing group sessions and he literally stood right next to me mm -hmm. for years telling these stories and ninja going through time and space and everywhere and you know these massive adventures and it's all this you know it, it's all work but then you look at somebody for years and years daily at work and it just it's it's hard to pick like i said one one memory because there were so many wonderful things uh, about kirby and um it feels very surreal talking about him in in the past tense it's um yeah 
you know, you get, you get close to somebody in a way that is just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost indescribable, but, um, if I had to pick just because we happened to get it on camera and because it's something that people can see, um, Tab of the St. Germain was guest starring on uh, Ninjago. Oh yeah. And she, uh, she came in with a whole bunch of ties <laughs> and, um, bless her for this. Um, I love you, Tabitha. She <laughs> was taking pictures of people wearing the ties and they would pose and they did a funny thing. And, you know, she was, you know, tweeting out pictures of us and, um, she decided to do a video and she's like, Oh, I'll do a video. And I was like, great. Um, I'll do a, I'll do a remedial tie tie class with Kirby. And I was like, okay, so are you rolling? And she's like, yeah, okay. I'm like, okay, so here's what we're going to do. And I started tying his tie and playing out the, as if that, you know, I was dad tying <laughs> yeah. a tie for his son, you know, dad's tie ties for their sons and talking about the dance, the <laughs> dance, totally fictitious. And I was like, now when you get to the dance, what you're going to want to do is loosen it. He's like, loosen it. I'm like, don't loosen it. He goes, don't loosen it. I'm like, what you actually want to do is you want to tie it loose to begin with. He's oh, and we just, we had this really funny, totally improvised, unscripted back and forth. And I was tying his tie and he was like, yes, I am. I am a handsome boy. And um, yeah, no. And I was like, yeah, because we just want you to look good because you're a handsome boy and we love you. And I gave him a little kiss on the cheek and we posed. And um, yeah, she got it all on camera and you know it's this wonderful tweet um that's out there and it's this wonderful memory but um yeah no you can absolutely fall in love with someone at work and he's just such a lovely human being and he put so much of himself into what he did mm -hmm. uh, i know so many people out there miss him um you know i i am one of them we are all connected in this very sad loss and um yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna miss him forever but uh yeah we're all brothers mm, that's a great yeah. answer yeah. yeah um i got um the thing that i like to end all my interviews with is asking uh do you have an answer as to what you want your legacy, uh, your legacy to be yes with the exception of and i mean i'll say the obvious because i mean i'm a married man i married my best friend from childhood she and i we have four lovely kids oh, okay. um i love my children endlessly and my family um and they are a big part of legacy mm -hmm. Right. But when I look at, I mean, my IMDb, it keeps like ticking up every, every year. I'm like, oh, one more credit. I'll chalk up another one. And, you know, that's not part of my legacy in my mind. I think about my passion for teaching and working with people and teaching new voiceover artists and humble, beginning, hopeful voiceover artists, working with them, training with them, coaching and doing voice direction and bringing life out of people's voice that has been I think the greatest joy of my profession is teaching people how to channel what's already there and give voice to something that's without them completely lifeless mm -hmm. I think that the best way anybody can leave a legacy in the arts is to teach and to watch those students grow regardless of age to take on a new skill, man, you're unconscious incompetence. I don't even know that. I don't know conscious incompetence. Now I know I don't know, but I'm learning something and I feel good about it. That's okay. I'm going to take some skills or some classes that I'm doing some other stuff, a little development, conscious competence. Now I know what I'm doing. I'm doing it on purpose and I'm still developing myself unconscious competence. I don't even do it on purpose anymore. I'm like, Oh, we're done. Oh, and the check is ready. And you're sending me a car? Ah, forget about it. You know what I mean? Like, there are levels that you can get to in this industry. But um, everybody who says giving back is the shit, they are right. Mm -hmm. If you can teach and if you can develop people, that's a real legacy. Right. And I'd like to think that after working with hundreds of students over the years, 
I'd like to think that creating a stronger community with stronger artists and stronger storytellers, I'd like to think that's a pretty good legacy to leave behind one day. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. Uh, thanks for willing to do this. I'm glad that I got to talk to you because it was really- Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, man, me too. Thank you so much for your time. It's been, it's been great. Wow, that flew by. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed too that I mean, there's a lot of voice actors I know that are really interacting with fans and stuff, but you especially with a lot of your, you're, uh, you're very open to uh, communicating with people on Twitter and doing things for people. And I try, yeah. you know, I, I, I realize the value of getting to know people. Mm -hmm. And then I try to reverse engineer that in order to better understand, you know, what it must be like for you know a, a fan right Some, sometimes right like you you can't create content and then never put yourself in a fan's shoes mm -hmm. and i mean you're talking to a guy who was like nervous gulp hi al pacino like without being you know uncool i was like hey hi, hi. you know like i have i have been starstruck before it happens and you know i i feel like if i can do what i can to engage with people and interact with people when I can. And I mean, I say that with so much love in my heart for everyone that, you know, I, I don't get to talk to you all the time. I mean, you guys are wonderful. I'd love to be on social media all day, but you know, you gotta, you gotta pay the bills. It's, it's hard work. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot to be said about, you know, engaging with fans. And I'm just glad now that after all these years of sort of just being on the periphery of, you know, people who work, you know, you start to, you, you start to get a, a, a little, a little follow, you know, and people just, they just want to reach out. And most of them are trying to do good. Mm -hmm. I try to ignore the people that are out to get people. Right. <laughs> I kind of think about them the same way I think about Ninjago villains. I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to band together and kick your ass. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been great chatting. Thank you so much for, for your time. Yeah. I'll, I'll be sure to, once I have it up on YouTube, I'll send it to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to share it on, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to open a new, you know, open a new TikTok. Really <laughs> well, you know, right? I, I'm old, you see, so most of the technology is, is so new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, I have, I have plans. I'm gonna, I'm gonna broaden my online presence to try and just reach more people. Um, so I'm gonna sleep less, but you know, I'll have more stories out there. <laughs> <All right. laughs>